Hi everyone, I'm going to be talking to you about design thinking, and specifically about design thinking, how you can use design thinking at the product level. And a little bit about me, just to tell you why am I talking about this. So I'm a design researcher, and I came into the world of UX through design thinking. And through my years of experience, I also have incorporated Lean UX and recently Jobs to be Done. Lots of buzzwords in there, but these are the frameworks that shape my practice. And today I'm talking to you from my own experience working for many different product teams across different industries, but also the stuff I read and influences my practice. And my talk is going to be divided into two parts. The first part is going to tell you what design thinking is and why do we need it. And the second part is, as Dani has told you, looking critically into how we are applying design thinking and how can we make it work for product teams. So what is design thinking? If you will it, you will get this. It's kind of confusing a lot of representations of it. But this is because it's not a simple thing, so different people see different perspectives of it. And I'm gonna give you my perspective, how I see design thinking. This is how I came into design thinking, this is the guys that basically define design thinking, the Stanford D School, and these are the stages that you go through in design thinking. You empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. And we have the famous double diamond. They saw something else. They saw the divergent and convergence nature of design thinking, but actually they quite can be together with this group. In the first diamond, we diverge, when we empathize, when we go into the world of our customers. And then we converge when we define what we have seen. So we can take it on the second diamond where we diverge when we ideate. And then we converge again when we prototype and test. But then we came into the agile world and these things are not linear. And I like the IBM's loop because it reflects the nature. You don't do just one diamond and the second. You go across the two. But all of them, they have two main things in common. There are two clear phases. There is the thinking phase and there is the making phase. And we move between the two. One thing that I really want you to take from this today is design thinking is not a formula that you repeat. If you use it that way, you're gonna get into what Steve Blank calls the innovation theater. He said this for Lean, is applicable completely for design thinking. So why do we need design thinking? Previously, to get impact in digital products, in other products as well, but this is quite specific for this to do. We have a customer that interacted with a device, and we have to look into feasibility, usability, and viability. But that is not enough anymore. And there are some things telling us this. Customer behaviors and expectations have changed. What executives think, the customers think of their companies, is not necessarily what the customers expect from their companies. There is a massive gap in them. And it's all about understanding these behaviors. And we need, we need to do a bit more to understand customer behaviors. Usability is one part of it, but not, not the only thing. And this is the folk model. Um, it describes that behaviors are um, influenced by ability, but also motivation and triggers. 
And those things, actually, maybe we are not paying that much attention. And these are things that we need to if we want to influence them. So the complexity of interactions have changed. You will here know this pretty well. These days, people don't interact one, with one device. They interact across many channels and devices in different contexts. Um, but what influences them to actually use things? I use jobs to be done. Jobs to be done, I'm not going to go too much into what it is, but they are, for me, jobs to be done are needs, customer needs, but not any needs, are the needs that define why I use this product, that make me want to use the product. And I, through my work as a researcher, I started realizing they go quite well organized in the Maslow hierarchy of needs. At the bottom, we have the functional jobs. For example, let's say we were working on a social media application. My, one of my functional jobs will be I want to um, share something with my audience, with the people that follow me. But um, that is not why I'm sharing things. I'm sharing things because above that, there is a social job. I want my followers to actually keep following, following me. I want to keep my reputation. I want them to like me. And above that, there is something even higher, that um, an emotional job. I want to be faithful to who I am, my brand, and what I value. So all of this are things that define why I do, why I interact, my behaviors. However, companies in general, in my experience, they know some of the functional jobs. They rarely understand social and emotional, meaning it's quite difficult. You're going to affect loyalty and trust if you don't know them. So design thinking, like lean and agile in the past, got a lot of attention and excitement, and people started using it. And recently, we can, the criticism started to emerge. And I'm not going to go through that criticism. I come from a science background. And before this missing a whole framework, you look critically to it and think, how are we applying this framework? And why it might be that all of these people are complaining about it? And I have thrown this into um, two sets of problems. And the first theme is called designing blind. We design blind when we don't understand the type of problem we're solving. When we start building too early, and when we are missing the think phase and do only the make phase. So let's start with the first one. It's how you're going to find an impactful solution if you don't really understand the problem you're solving. And when I say problem is the type of problem, this is something I rarely see product teams assessing. And this is called Canadian. Canadian framework is something that comes from the agile world, and that's why I use it, because it's something that we can have in common with the design world. Um, I'm not going to go through it, but I can tell you that design thinking doesn't apply to all these problems. Design thinking is good, particularly for complex problems, and as well for complicated problems. What it is? This. Complicated problems are something that is established, Probably we have a hint of what the solution is going to be, but we need to apply it to the specific needs of our company. For example, let's say I'm an e-commerce and my wish list is not really working. And I look at Spotify playlist and I think, wow, if we could make wish list so successful as Spotify playlist, that would be a complicated problem because we need to understand where the problem are and how we adapt it. In order to do this, if you were using design thinking, there is not a set path. I cannot give you the formula how you will walk through the think and make phases, but definitely you will need a one think phase for sure. Then you might need another one, but at least one and quite a few make phases. You could even get started with the making. And but always have in mind that you have to go at some point in the thinking. Complex problems are 
what in design we call wicked problems. They are poorly understood, they're unique to our situation, and they require new solutions. They're really exciting for designers. But, for example, it will be how might we change traditional media to hook millennials? Um, that's not an easy solution. We don't even know where to get started. There is not a formula how you can walk through the thinking and making faces. But for sure, you will have to go through a back and forth between the two. So let's move into the second one. Start building before you, if you start building before you have defined the problem um, and the criteria to solve it, it's quite dangerous. And particularly with complicated and complex problems. What tends to happen when we do this is that we start building, and as we build things, we start realizing, oh, that's not the problem, the problem is this, or this is not the right job to be done to affect. And then when we start getting into what it is that we need to do, we have already invested in a product that has been built, and we cannot change direction. And that means what we are building is not going to have the impact that we expect. So what do we do? We need to learn to understand when to move fast and when to move slow, meaning the moving fast works really well for chaotic and obvious problems, not so well for complex and complicated. And when I say moving slow, it means that you, I like strategize this 12-week design sprint. It means that you stop for 12 weeks and actually do that design thinking process. And then you can start building. And the third problem, this one is quite big. It's missing the thinking phase. If you do that, it's really, really, I will say, unlikely that you're going to get an impactful solution. So, and particularly for these complex and complicated problems. I have seen this repeatedly in product teams. For example, they never do thinking phase. They always iterate in a making. Or they have a different team, maybe a really amazing service design team who is doing the thinking phase, but when they give the stuff to the product team that is going to take it into the making phase, they don't know how to use what they are given. Or, as well, there is one essential thing in the thinking phase, empathy. And what does it mean, empathy? It means that we actually observe um, our customers or potential customers in the real world, not bringing them into the lab. It's actually going and observing them. It's really important for product teams to do that. And they cannot build that empathy. There is no substitute for this. So one thing that we need to start doing, and I'm a researcher and I'm always advocating for this, is bring your product teams into the world of the customer. And I'm going to go through a few of the outcomes or outputs of the thinking phase that are super useful to inform decisions in the making phase, but that most people don't know how to use in the product teams, so quite a lot of the ones I have worked with. So one is the customer journeys. A customer journey is something where you start with the steps at the top. Steps means from, let's say, we are in an e-commerce um, company, from the moment my customer starts thinking about buying something to the research phase to so, 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 I buy something to I'm starting using this product to you can even go, I want to return this product, I'm not happy with it, or I need to exchange. So all of those are the steps. And what we do is we map out the emotional journey, the ups and downs. We go through the different and devices and channels they go through, and the switches. This is really important. We identify where there are friction in those switches between channels. And then we look at all of this and we think, how are we doing for the core jobs we don't, we need to meet? Where are we not meeting them? And we start extracting down here the frustrations, really important frustrations. You actually can quantify those frustrations. You can give them severity ratings. And then you bring the company's KPIs, or business objectives. And in the context of this full end-to-end -end experience, you start together understanding 
where can we have impact for the objectives that we are seeking? And that's when you extract the opportunities. Another one, quite similar, but used in a slightly different way, service blueprints. We start at the top with those step by step, moving through channels and devices, but this time we concentrate on the actual interaction. And we look at how our system, when your customer's doing things in these channels and uh, the, um, devices, how the front end, the back end, and the operations behind your company are responding to it. When I mean operations, it's like call center, someone in customer services, someone in the shop. And when we look at this, I actually have had this situation where we look at this and then we start realizing, hold on a second, there are constraints here. There are problems that we have. And actually, if you look, sometimes you identify things that actually making changes in the front end will ch won't change anything. It won't have any impact until we solve the things down here. So customer journeys and service blueprints are fantastic tools to identify gaps of knowledge and to bring teams together, not only product teams, across the company. For all of us to look to the end-to-end -end experience and align on a strategy and what we need to do to improve. And the next one I'm going to talk about is the customer um, Core, um, core product behaviors. And behaviors don't mean personas or a person. Because I have seen this a lot. People equate this to um, one specific behavior. No, I can give you an example. When it comes to bees, I'm a wolf -ta. When it comes to wasps, I'm a total panicker. And how do we use this? How do we make decisions with them. So we use these core behaviors to actually make future assumptions. The value proposition canvas is a fantastic tool to do this. So how do we use that? Let's say we first look at the behavior you are looking for. In this case, I chose the wafter. And you mapped out what you know about that behavior. I have a pain. If my wafting is not really effective, I can get the bee upset and it can stun me. So my jobs are, I want to keep calm and come across as cool. And my gain is I don't want to stop what I'm doing. So based on that, we can start thinking how the product can satisfy this needs. And then, I don't know, I just did it quickly, like you can have a video guide for an effective and stylish wolf thing. So, to end this bit, I just need to say that we just need people that can work across the thinking and making phases and that can guide product teams to use what it comes out of the think phase and make decisions and use them. Because if you're living on a world, it's a waste. And that moves me into the second theme of problems, which is missing core elements of the design thinking. And these are having the wrong mindsets, in discovery, because design thinking is a discovery tool. Not iterating enough with solutions and not collaborating effectively. So, um, you won't find new solutions when you have the wrong mindsets doing the work. This is Simon Watley um, described these three mindsets, I call them. Um, pioneers, the settlers, and the town planners. This is something that I don't see product teams consciously do, understand who, is, who are the people in my team. So this, the pioneers are people that are um, at ease in uncertainty. They love exploring and discovering. And they come up with really innovative ideas, but they are hard baked And they need to be given to the settlers. And then the settlers actually make them useful. And when they have done that, they give it to the town planners who actually build and optimize. And that, again, I am not one of them only. I have a pioneer and a settler. I just need to understand when I am one or the other, or when I need to be one or the other. And one of the problems I see many times happening is you either have town planners doing discovery. That's a bad idea, because 
You will never get innovative ideas if you do that. Or you have pioneers doing the work, but then not having the settling part and giving it directly to the town planners. And that ends up in two ways I have seen. One is it goes nowhere and the company thinks this is not a good product, even though it has the potential. Or it's a half-baked product and it will never achieve the impact we expected from it. And I'm gonna to move to the second problem, which is you won't find effective new solutions if you don't play with ideas. This is fundamental for design thinking. I like how uh, Alex Osuwado put this. So for complex and complicated problems, I can guarantee you the first idea you have is not the best idea. And actually you will have to go through many alternatives and shape that idea massively. We, we have the tool, we have this um, prototyping, testing, learning, and changing, but we need to really push that change. So the solution for these two problems will be to actually really be aware which phase you are in and what do you need to do, what kind of mindsets you need at each of them. In discovery, we need pioneer mindset. We need to focus on problem definition. We need discovery and explorative research. You can prototype, but actually, in this case, I will say you can prototype. Doing provocative prototyping. This is not about getting the right solution. This is about helping your customers and potential customers envisioning new futures, or even crossing the line, understanding when they get upset, when you actually went too far. And this is an amazing learning. This is the time you challenge assumptions. Then we move into the concepting phase. And that will be more on the making side of the design thinking. That's the place for settlers, solution exploration, definition research, and iteration of prototypes. This is when we need to play with ideas. We need to really push it and find different things. Don't fall in love with one. And then once we have done this for a while, you will get to something that starts to be, you know, this is a good thing. We are getting good feedback now. And that's when you move it into the town planners for doing, this is what a lot of product teams are quite used to do. Um, and my final <clears throat> problem is you won't find solutions without a well-orchestrated collaboration. Collaboration is another fundamental ingredient in design thinking. But, Martin Hansen, in this fantastic book, great at work, based on a lot of research, he went to many people around the world, good performers, bad performers, good projects, bad projects, and extracted what makes something work. And they actually discovered over-collaborating is as damaging as under-collaborating. Under-collaborating is silo, what we have in companies. But if you basically just not thinking about who needs to collaborate, and having a compelling reason for that collaboration, and you just put people in a room and expect them to collaborate, that's when over-collaboration happens. So we need to have facilitators of collaboration. And what does it mean? It means that someone thinks, who needs to be in this specific uh, room, what skills, you know, and bring the right skills at the right time. Give them clear objectives of why they are collaborating and facilitate it. And to facilitate it in design thinking, we have workshops. But this is not something you can go and follow a recipe. It's something you do customize for each collaborative effort. So to wrap up, <clears throat> to be a design thinker, you need to develop a design thinking mindset. You need to go into the customer world and learn from their real life experiences. You need to ideate. <clears throat> with what it comes out of the thinking phase. You need to get the problems, the core behaviors, and learn to, learn to work with those end-to-end -end journeys. You need to focus on the why and the how, not, not on the what, in order to ideate and iterate. You need to boldly prototype and prototype to shape the product. And you need to practice and fail and learn the methodology. Because 
Following recipes doesn't make a master chef. And we learn from experience, and we learn when do we need to use the right tools for the problem we have and for the team that we are dealing with. So I would like that you guys take any of these that resonated with you today. I know it's a lot of ideas here. I have gone really quickly through a lot of stuff. But if anything resonated with you, just go and play and try to make it better and bring design thinking into your product teams so we can have better practice. Thank you. <laughs>